I, I'd like to thank the Bar Council for this kind invitation uh, to speak at this forum on a subject that's suddenly become very topical. And I thank the Council for inviting me, which I regard as a singular honour. Can I, at the outset, disclose my interest in the matter? Um, I, I, uh, my firm is retained as solicitors and uh, act as counsel for Trungano, and we've also uh, been advising Kelantan. But I must say that I have mandate from neither state to speak on their behalf. Obviously, I'm giving my personal views, but I wanted to state that obviously it's partisan. Um, this subject is steeped in history, as Tunku Razali mentioned. You cannot understand the dispute as you probably cannot understand any political or legal dispute in isolation. A bit of uh, historical uh, background is necessary. Uh, insofar as uh, the road up to Madika is concerned, when the nine million states were part of the British colony, they had some recognition in public international law. For, so for example, the most outstanding public international law recognizing uh, sovereign immunity was a Johor state, Miguel and Johor, which recognized the Sultan of Johor in the 1850s as a, uh, in, uh, a sovereign who was immune from uh, suit in courts. Likewise, there is a famous public international law case called Duff against Klantan. And then I think, I think it was the 1920s where Klantan's role as an international player is recognized. So it's, it's quite simplistic to say that the, Malay, the nine Malay states in particular had no role. But I think what would be uh, sufficient is to say that the demarcation between the British uh, colonial power and the uh, nine Malay states, the state settlements before 57 was not clear. That takes you to the Madinka negotiations in 55-56 between the alliance coalition, the Malay rulers which had its own delegation under the British supervision and of course the British rulers were not going to leave Malaysia unless uh, a, a deal was reached and the, the, and the fierce, the vigorous bargaining took place at that stage uh, between uh, the states and the federation on this aspect and I think what that tells you is that and that's of course found in the ninth schedule and I won't read it that is the background to the ninth and tenth schedules the different lists all I need to say is at that stage it is very clear that if oil or any other petroleum or mineral rights were found on the land, it certainly belonged to the state. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but if it uh, was outside the state, offshore, then it is quite ambiguous. And I think the reason is in 55, 56, 57, no one had seriously considered petroleum because, of course, we did not, Malaya did not. Uh, have, uh, did not enjoy petroleum rights in 56, 57, 58. The Truman Doctrine had just been announced and the law of the sea conference had not got off the ground. So it, it is understandable that the, the 55, 56, 57 negotiations did not address the matter. And then of course in 1963 you had Malaysia coming in, coming on board with Sabah, Sarawak and Singapore. Again there were no major changes. So really until the early 1970s, when, when Tunku Razali was invited by Tun Razak and, he's already, and Tunku has already mentioned the history. Until that stage, there was no discussion on the important question of the ownership of petroleum rights. And that is what that, that must be kept in mind. When, we talk, when, when, my, when I come to territorial waters, I will say that the whole thing is a red herring because territorial waters have, have got nothing to do with ownership of petroleum. And that is what this issue is all about. And as Tunku Razali mentioned, Tun Razali in the early 70s realized, look, there is a problem about ownership. Because what was happening in the early 70s was Sarawak had a series of lopsided contracts with Shell. Um, the, uh, there was an exploration starting uh, off uh, the South China Sea. Exxon and Konoko were given areas to uh, explore. But the ownership per se of petroleum was unclear. And that is the background. The ownership was unclear, never dealt with. And that resulted in the 1974 Petroleum De Development Act. It's not the Petronas Act, uh, Prof. It's PDA, Petroleum Development Act, which has a couple of things. It leads to the foundation of Petronas, the establishment of Petronas, and more importantly, the recognition of ownership of petroleum 
for the very first time. So this is the only act in Malaysia which deals with the issue of ownership of petroleum. So to me, making reference to 10 other acts are totally relevant, is as irrelevant as making reference to the Higher Purchase Act or the Money Lending Act. When I am asked to answer a question about the ownership of petroleum and cash payments, reference to the Higher Purchase Act doesn't advance the case one bit. And so with the criticism of respect, all those references to, the, to those acts are irrelevant because the PDA, the Petroleum Development Act, it's a short act, read it for yourself, never once mentions the doctrine of territorial waters. It is silent on territorial waters. What it talks about is onshore and offshore. The two doctrines are onshore and offshore. They are not identified and uh, defined, uh, they, are, they are not defined in the act. And what it really means is, uh, and actually Tun Saleh was really the draftsman. Tunku Razali was probably the, the, the brains behind, but Tun Saleh, whom I've interviewed, and was part of the legal team, and of course I accept what Cecil says, that finally the intention will not, uh, uh, the draftsman may not carry weight, if he's not translated properly. But their intention was very simple. It really meant land, onshore and seas offshore. Waters, seas offshore, land onshore. So we start using the two uh, words land and water, uh, land and seas, which the parliamentary draftsman could have used. The parliamentary draftsman used onshore, offshore. And those two words are repeated in the agreement and the grants. And I should say that Tuku Razali, on behalf of Petronas, signed 14 agreements on behalf of Petronas, 13 with the 13 states, and one with the federal government. All those 14 agreements are identical. Then we come to grants. He again signed 14 grants, one with the federation, and 13 with the 13 grants. So this dispute, in a sense, or much as history is important, finally can be resolved by an interpretation of the PDA, 14 agreements and 14 grants. And in all these, and if I use a neutral term, documents, you never see the word or words territorial waters. You see the words onshore and offshore. And then in June 1978, the first cash payment by Petronas was made to Trangano. And this is for, uh, for in respect of oil which was found 150 miles 150 from the waters from the coast of Trangano and in a place called Pulai. So if, if I stop there and say look if the territorial waters meant so much Petronas has to explain why from 1978 June and for 22 years it continued to pay 7.8 billion dollars to Trangano in respect of oil found 150 miles off the coast of Trangano, 22 years. And of course, there's no answer to that. Uh, and of course, at that stage, the argument about territorial waters did not uh, make its appearance. And then of course, in November 99, there was the general elections <coughs> passed from the state government, and in, in, they received one payment which was uh, the, the end of the year, and then, uh, sorry, March 2000, they received the payment, and that was the last of the payments, and then in September 2000, the payment ceased. So if I can stop, if we can go to September 2000, uh, the payment suddenly stopped, and my argument is, there was absolutely no legal basis for ceasing payments. Instead, it was a political decision taken by Prime Minister Dr. Mahathir to prevent his political adversaries, the past, from receiving cash payments. So when AMLO through Dr. M perceived it as a threat to their political survival, a political decision was made. And then they described the obligation to pay as Wong Asan, which is a political label which has got no legal basis. 